Hello, I'm Chappie Conrad. I'm one of the vice chairs of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and director of the sarcoma service at the University of Washington. The sarcoma service at the university delivers care to patients with sarcomas within our Cancer Care Alliance, which we call the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. It includes the fusion of the University of Washington with the Hutchinson Center and the Children's Hospital. I'd like to discuss uh, with you today the uh, treatment of sarcoma patients and uh, some of the advances that we've experienced over the last 10 to 15 years with these patients. A sarcoma is a malignancy of connective tissues. It it's, uh, differs from malignancies of glandular tissues, which are much more common and typically most commonly occur in the lung, the prostate, the breast tissue, and all the more common malignancies. Sarcomas are on, uh, much less common but very important because they occur in our, all age groups, they're large tumors. Um, they've uh, given us a lot of information about the biology of cancer that, uh, that has implications for the more common types of malignancies. And they're a very treatable uh, type of malignancy. This is a slide of an MRI from a patient with a tumor in their uh, thigh. This is a cross section uh, through, through, a, uh, through a thigh. Uh, this is the normal side. Here's the tumor. It's a large, white-looking uh, image. And these, despite uh, being a relatively large uh, tumor that may originate from muscle or tendon or even uh, bone, uh, it's a tumor that presents with very little pain and only a subtle soft tissue mass. So they're difficult to diagnose uh, early on. And these types of tumors uh, have a type of uh, uh, biology that's similar to other tumors but their direct cause in many cases is still being uh, investigated. These patients uh, present with a bit of a diagnostic delay. It usually t they have very subtle symptoms. When they have a tumor in the soft tissues, like in the muscle tissue, they'll only present with a painless mass. Um, they can have those symptoms, initially thinking that they have a muscle strain, and that can occur for up to three to six months before they have a diagnosis. If they have a tumor in a more difficult location, such as the pelvis, it can take 6 to 12 months before a diagnosis is reached. Um, early treatment is key in these patients, and uh, uh, distinguishing whether those are high-grade tumors or low-grade tumors can have an important effect on the patient. We have an excellent team of doctors and nursing staff and support staff for sarcomas. Uh, we have one dedicated oncologist, Dr. Schutze at the university, and Dr. Hawkins at Chorwins. We have a dedicated pathologist, Dr. Rubin at the University, a dedicated imaging uh, uh, specialist, Dr. Erie, who pilots our PET scan program, which is a pivotal part of our program, and a large group of orthopedic and general surgeons. One of the things that keeps us uh, together as a unit and a, a well-organized unit is the fact that uh, we get together two or three times a week in clinic we, uh, and in the conference. We review all the new patients on a weekly basis in conference with all of us together. And we uh, take care of patients together, both the oncologist and the surgeons together in clinic at our SCCA clinic uh, in Southeast Lake Union. Another thing that distinguishes our service is our comprehensive tumor registry that we have to register the care of all sarcoma patients, which is almost unique, uh, uh, believe it or not, in the cancer world. Many of these tumor registries are hospital-based and uh, um, many times don't collect enough information to be useful for a specific subtype of patient. We have that kind of dedicated sarcoma tumor registry for all of our patients to assist with patient care and patient education. The big challenge for a sarcoma patient is to distinguish early on whether that patient is at risk for metastasis or a spread of their tumor from the location of where the tumor originally started, such as the leg or the arm or the pelvis, uh, and whether it has a risk of spreading to the lungs, which is typically where it goes through uh, via the bloodstream. 
That decision traditionally has been made with a biopsy. The biopsy is uh, done usually as a surgical procedure, occasionally as a needle procedure. And that piece of tissue is then looked at very carefully by a pathologist, and a decision is made about whether that tumor is high grade or low grade. Uh, and many times, difficult decisions have to be made between those two uh, types of uh, categories. A high grade patient would be at risk to have a metastasis, and their uh, life would be threatened by that tumor because the tumor would spread to their lungs and kill them by, by uh, that process of tumor growing in the lungs. So a, a major decision in these patients early on is with the biopsy and whether they need and deserve chemotherapy and whether chemotherapy would be useful. When a pathologist is looking at that biopsy, they have a very difficult task at hand. Um, they do have some additional uh, stains they, they can use uh, under the microscope, but much of the old information by looking at a tumor under the microscope is uh, being added to today by more sophisticated techniques. This is a slide of a liposarcoma, which is a fatty malignancy on the left, and a sarcoma that's undifferentiated uh, on the right. And while the, there's a big difference in the number of cells in these two slides, uh, you can imagine that the experts uh, will disagree on what kind of tumor this is and also whether it's a high-grade tumor or a low-grade tumor. And uh, it is a very challenging part of the business that we've improved with better biology. This is part of that better biology. It's a, a DNA fingerprint, if you will, of the tumor. Uh, we have a technique now that will take many of these tumors at one time and do an assessment of their DNA content and what distinguishes that type of tumor based on its DNA content in terms of subtype, in terms of grade, what type of molecular markers there are to distinguish the subtype of that tumor, and also to put it, these tumors in the different sorts of families in terms of the uh, defect, the DNA defect in one particular tumor. These are very important sorts of new DNA fingerprintings that can occasionally help us direct, directly uh, focus treatment on an enzyme or protein deficiency that we can correct with a particular type of drug. So these new cDNA microarray techniques that we try to do on all of our patients will help us not only determine who's at risk, but what kind of treatment they might have and what kind of treatment might be directed in terms of molecular defect. Here's the typical sarcoma in an adult. It's a soft tissue sarcoma. It occurs in the calf. This is an MRI of a, of a calf. <clears throat> Here's the left posterior calf. Here's the right lower extremity. You can see a large tumor here in the upper calf of this patient. It's actually behind the tibia bone here in a very awkward location next to every major artery and nerve in this patient's leg. This patient was given chemotherapy. They had a very good response to chemotherapy. Their tumor was then taken out surgically. They were also uh, finished their chemotherapy, received radiation therapy, and is doing extremely well several years down the road with an MRI now that shows basically a normal leg, an excellent function. The basic model for treatment in these tumors uh, is still a little bit controversial. There's no controversy that an assessment needs to be made with a biopsy early on in the patients and a decision made about whether chemotherapy should be given at all and whether it should be given early or late. We're big advocates of early chemotherapy in these patients. We monitor them very carefully with repeat MRIs and repeat PET scans. PET scans, in addition to improved biology, are the key to the, most of the improvements we've made in our patients in addition to a few new chemotherapy drugs that allow us to treat patients who would previously be unresponsive to chemotherapy. So any one particular patient would come in, have a biopsy, make a decision, yes or no, about chemotherapy, receive chemotherapy the first month, the second month, have more imaging, have a surgical resection, and then receive the rest of their chemotherapy. Let me tell you a little bit about PET scans. A PET scan is a proton emission tomography. It's a fancy scan to evaluate whether a tumor is metabolically active. It involves the imaging of a labeled glucose molecule, for instance, in this particular case. It tells us how fast this particular tumor is eating up glucose and whether they're doing it rapidly or slowly. This is a great example of a large sarcoma. Here we see an MRI in this particular patient. Uh, this is their, the back of the thigh in a patient with a tumor that's almost 20 centimeters 
or 10, 10 inches in size. This is a large tumor and it varies tremendously from its north pole to its south pole and in the middle. In this particular case, we did a PET scan prior to the bio biopsy of this patient, and it shows a very active tumor or a hot spot in the north pole of that tumor. The middle part is mixed. Half of it's very active, half of it's inactive, and the south pole is very inactive in this particular tumor. That enabled us to biopsy this patient in the most active location, and for uh, research investigational purposes, we did three biopsies in this patient, all with a needle, so that it involved uh, no significant trauma to the patient. And the biopsy from the top showed a very active high-grade tumor. The biopsy in the middle showed a tumor that was sort of mixed grade uh, with intermediate grade pathology. The biopsy from the bottom showed an inactive dead tumor, a tumor for which we had not given chemotherapy. And this is a good example of how a PET scan can help us be more accurate about grading patients with regards to their risk early on and also assessing their response to treatment. So these PET scans don't give a perfect image of the tumor, but they give a very reliable metabolic image of the tumor. And they give us a number, a number that we can quantify, a number anywhere from 1 to 20 that tells us which tumors are really hot and active and need chemotherapy and which tumors are relatively inactive and don't need chemotherapy. That decision is made up front with a PET scan when we first see the patient, helps us direct the biopsy, helps us make an assessment of what the patient risk is. We repeat a PET scan after their first few cycles of chemotherapy. That helps us make a decision about whether chemotherapy is working or not. And if we have any problems with deciding where to do the biopsy in the patient, a PET scan also helps us with that. It's a very valuable tool today for these patients. There's a PET scan data. We've got a uh, very fully funded uh, project on PET scans for sarcomas. It's one of the pilot projects for, can for imaging cancer uh, with the NIH. Um, here's the prediction of a, of a hot PET scan, a pet, PET scans in sarcoma patients where the SUV value, the uptake value is less than six, shows a higher survival in patients uh, with a PET scan that has a number that greater than six. So a patient with a really hot PET scan initially is more at risk to have a worse survival than a patient with a low number early on. If they have a good response to chemotherapy, their prognosis is equally significant. If we image their chemotherapy response on a PET scan and it shows a good response to chemotherapy, that patient will probably do very well. And that's the earliest signal we can get that chemotherapy is working in our patients a very valuable new advance in the imaging of these patients. We'd like to have more effective drugs for sarcoma patients. Uh, we do have many clinical trials, some of which are in our own hospital, some of which deal with uh, children's protocols that we now apply to young adults, some of which have to do with carefully uh, regulated studies with new drugs through the FDA and through uh, various uh, options in North America for treating patients with new drugs and uh, other collaborative groups in North America that deal with the treatment of sarcoma patients and new drugs, all very carefully guided uh, protocols, typically referred to as clinical trials. These are crucial in discovering new drugs. It's been a while since we've had really effective new drugs in sarcomas, and we do have some new drugs in the last few years that have proved to be very effective for these patients. Tumor surgery to these patients mostly involves uh, surgery on the soft tissues. Here's an example of a forearm with a small tumor that had a relatively low PET scan early on. We could make the decision to take this tumor out with an operation despite this uh, gaping wound. Uh, uh, this is an operation that takes away very few functional muscles and really leaves this patient with a very functional forearm. Here's a the bone tumor version of sarcoma, a large bone tumor in the lower femur, just above the knee joint. Here's the knee joint here. And uh, this is a malignant tumor. We have to take out the entire six to eight inches of this femur, and we can now replace that with a metallic femur and a total knee replacement. This is the regular total knee plus another six to eight inches of resected femur. These patients do very well with these procedures, and we have an example of that one of my patients here today. 
Here's a more difficult pelvic tumor that's almost invisible on a plain x-ray with a huge tumor seen on MRI. It shows the importance of MRI imaging for these patients. Let me talk a little bit about bony limb sparing surgery for these patients, the ability to take out uh, a large segment of bone. This is a tumor that occurred in the proximal tibia. The tibia is the large bone in your calf. It represents the lower half of your knee joint. Here's the knee joint. Here's the femur. Uh, this is a tumor that's making a white uh, image here in the proximal tibia. It's a bone forming tumor called an osteosarcoma. We see it in teenagers and young adults. Here's an MRI of the same thing. This is the proximal tibia. This is the abnormal area of the bone tumor. Here's uh, the tumor going out of the bone into the soft tissues. And here's the knee joint up above. This entire bone is resected out and replaced with a proximal tibial replacement here. Here's the knee joint. Here's where the tibia was cut. And this metallic bone plus a knee joint is very functional in these patients. So when we combine the uh, big step up that we've had with imaging using a PET scan. Here's, the, here's a, uh, a lower extremity tumor, uh, again, in the thigh. This is a tumor in the anterior thigh. This is the left thigh with a tumor in it. This is the right thigh, which is normal. This is the patient when they first came in. They had this large tumor in their thigh with a pretty hot-looking PET scan. The number on that PET scan with the uptake value was 14.3. They got two cycles of chemotherapy. Their PET scan improved dramatically. Their PET scan number now was four. The MRI showed some improvement, but not the dramatic change you see on the PET scan. They had their surgery and their uh, tumor removed after this PET scan, which, where the number was again lower after a few more cycles of chemotherapy, and that patient's doing very well with a good response. Uh, this type of imaging has allowed us to do uh, more functional surgery. We could take tumors out where we didn't used to be able to take tumors out. We can combine that with bony surgery in patients who have osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas, and we can really improve the function of these patients at the same time that they were increasing their survival. Here's a, an extreme example of a difficult case. It shows you the imaging uh, that we have for these patients now. This is the old-fashioned imaging of a plain x-ray. If you see very carefully, here's a bone-forming tumor in the first or second rib of this patient's chest. This is an arteriogram that shows the blood vessels going to this tumor, shows a subtle blush or an increase in small blood vessels around that tumor. This is a CAT scan that's a cross section cutting like a loaf of bread across the body. And this is the trachea in the front, spinal cord in the back, in the first rib, and a large tumor here. This is an MRI that shows a large tumor here, this large mass is all tumor directly abutting the spinal cord. Here's the spinal cord with tumor beginning to invade the spinal cord. This patient was given chemotherapy. Their tumor occurred here, uh, the upper thoracic vertebral body, and allowed an operation that would otherwise not have been doable without chemotherapy and without good imaging. So this is an example of the improvements in imaging the improvements of uh, uh, biology, in addition to the improvements of chemotherapy and surgery, that's had a huge benefit on all of our patients. Patients uh, are seen at the uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance uh, by these referral numbers. They're seen in our regular bone tumor clinic here. And they can also be referred uh, through the website, uh, through this uh, website uh, for new patients. We hope that in the near future, with continued improvements of metabolic imaging in sarcoma patients, carefully monitoring new drugs and an early response to treatment, understanding the biology of these patients that will improve the cure rate of all these patients dramatically in the next four to five years. I'd like to uh, change uh, uh, stride a little bit now and uh, sit down and have a discussion with a couple of the patients that we have uh, today in the studio about what their treatment has involved. We're back with two of my favorite patients, uh, Ina Hibbs and Becky Greenway. Uh, Ina had a soft tissue tumor in her calf that we treated uh, several years ago, and Becky had a bone tumor that was treated uh, more than 10 years ago. So she has a long perspective on, uh, on the care of patients with uh, bone tumors. 
I thought it would be helpful to talk about um, diagnosis issues and how a patient presents initially because that's a huge issue for many patients because it's very difficult to make the diagnosis and then talk a little bit about um, your treatment and the treatment of soft tissue tumors and the treatment of bone tumors. So Ina, thanks very much for being with us for today. Um, tell me a little bit about how you presented with your tumor in your calf. Um, <clears throat> initially, we, I had jog a lot and do a lot of hiking and things like that, and so it seemed to, to my husband and I that I had like a shin splint or something. So we treated it for about a year at our house. I, mean, I, just, I treated it with ice and heat and things like that. Eventually, it got really quite a bit larger than my other leg, noticeably larger and hard. So I used to say I have one good leg and one bad leg. Anyway, I went to the, the doctor, and um, fortunately for me, the doctor that I went to see was an intern who had just done a... Um, circuit or whatever they call rotation. it, a rotation in your um, area. And so the, the doctor that was there, a normal doctor said, well, it's probably tendonitis or something, treat it with ibuprofen. And I had been taking ibuprofen already. And she said, well, she'd rather see me have a CT, which she did, and from there I was diagnosed. Which is uh, the only way to make a diagnosis early on. So the average patient who presents with a soft tissue tumor has uh, a tumor either in their leg or their arm more common in their arm, uh, in their leg than in their arm. And they present with only a, uh, usually a painless mass uh, in, that, in that extremity. And the usual diagnostic delay is about uh, anywhere from three to six months. So um, uh, picking it up early is important. If, it gets, if it's in a tender area next to a major artery or a major nerve, it can hurt more. It can make you think you have shin splints. And, being able to distinguish that from shin splints comes down to being able to distinguish a very subtle soft tissue mass clinically or getting suspicious and doing either a CAT scan or an MRI. So that's, that's an absolutely crucial part of the equation because of the challenge because even the very best um, primary care doctor is going to struggle with making that diagnosis early. It's a very difficult diagnosis. Might be even more difficult in a, a child a teenager with an osteosarcoma or a young adult with an osteosarcoma. Why don't you tell us, Becky, uh, how you remember your presentation? I had a lot of night pain. Every night it would get worse. The only thing that would help it would be heat. During the day it would feel fine, but at night I'd get maybe two hours of sleep. I couldn't sleep at all. The pain was so bad. And I was misdiagnosed for about eight months, four, di four different physicians. They were diagnosing me with tendonitis and growing pains and giving me um, anti-inflammatories, putting me on crutches, and it just, it just would not get any better. And an orthopedic surgeon finally looked at it, and he saw the tumor immediately in the x-ray and sent me to see you. And that's, again, sort of typical for, for a malignancy in a young adult or a teenager. Um, Clearly, teenagers and young adults are usually beating the heck out of themselves playing recreational sports and stuff and getting sprains and strains. And uh, those are very, very common. And separating out a very subtle osteosarcoma around the knee joint is uh, difficult. The usual delay, again, is about the same as three to six months. And uh, you don't see it until you're at least several months down the road and not getting better from your quote unquote strain or sprain and uh, begin to get your first x-ray um, and getting suspicious from that, hopefully, uh, with some more imaging. Um, the typical symptomatology for a, a malignancy of bone is, uh, especially in a teenager, is to beware uh, night pain in a teenager. Night pain from growing pain. Growing pains occur in children who are well under the age of 10, usually. Mm -hmm. So if you get into the teenager ballpark, with a kid who's having night pain or a sprain that's not getting better after a couple of months, you're beginning to get on thin ice with regards to uh, the, the uh, confidence of your diagnosis. Um, let's talk about treatment a little bit. You know, you're, you're the typical, most common soft tissue sarcoma in an adult sort of scenario. Uh, you came in with a large tumor in your calf. Uh, we did a biopsy. Uh, we decided that it was high grade. Um, we gave you chemotherapy up front. You were just treated in the last two to three years, so you got the new sort of treatment with a PET scan. You had an impressive improvement in your PET scan uh, for a tumor in a very difficult location right around the major vessels in your lower calf. Um, that good response to early chemotherapy, 
which again isn't done uh, in many places, uh, which is chemotherapy before the surgery, has the benefit of shrinking your tumor, treating your whole body early, and of being able to evaluate response, allowed us to peel that out of your calf, give you more chemotherapy, takes about six to eight months to deliver the chemotherapy, sort of chemotherapy sandwich with surgery in the middle, and then at the end of that you get radiation therapy and you're over your treatment uh, at eight to ten months. It's a lot of treatment, a lot of time in the hospital. The surgery, which is a major procedure, almost becomes minor compared to uh, the fun of uh, chemotherapy for uh, eight months. What are the good things and the bad things you remember about your treatment? Um, I guess the, the worst part about it was the time in the hospital. I spent a lot of time in the hospital getting the chemotherapy and being away from my family was hard. Um, I think I was really lucky because I did respond really well to the chemotherapy and I didn't really have a lot of side effects. My grandmother had cancer probably 10 years before that and I think the drugs that they give you now maybe are better and, and they had a lot of they had counteractive kind of drugs that you can take that prevent a lot of the symptoms. So although you get really weak, very tired, you can't do the same sorts of things you could do before, I could still go to work when I wasn't in the hospital and that sort of thing. Becky is uh, 10 or 12 years down the road from an osteosarcoma with a tibia. I'll just show you very quickly uh, the basics of her tumor it was in her proximal tibia. The tibia again is the calf bone. It's, it's the lower part of the knee joint. So this is the tibia, this is the femur, and her tumor was here. Um, even with chemotherapy, you have to take the tumor out, and uh, that involves a, a huge chunk of bone that we take out. So we take out that tumor after chemotherapy and replace that with a metallic bone and the total knee joint built into each other. So here's her metallic tibia now. This is an attachment for her patella tendon, which is crucial for the function of her knee. There's nothing but skin and bone here at this level. The tibia causes a lot of wound complications, and Becky is a historical example of that. And this is the total knee replacement that also is required with this type of surgery. You can't just cut out the tibia and have, have your normal femur articulate with that piece of plastic because it wears out your knee joint too quickly. So you have to incorporate a total knee into her femur. So her femur is here and this is her total knee, this is her tibial replacement. And uh, she was initially treated with a bone transplant that didn't work, had uh, quite a few operations, finally converted it to a metallic tibia. Once this tibia attaches well here to the bone, this is an implant that's modular if she ever had any failed parts up here in the knee joint, we can snap those out and take them out and replace them quite easily if we had to do that. So the modularity of this implant, the fixation of it's been a gigantic step up for patients with this kind of tumor. Uh, these two patients are exceptional in terms of their courage and their strength. I don't think they're exceptional in terms of uh, how we try to take care of people. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come up here today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.